All right. So if you think back to years and years and years ago when you were in third grade um, and your teacher was like, today we're going to learn how to find the average of something and you added up a bunch of stuff and then divided by how many of them you had, right? They were like, let's find the average temperature today. And then they sent a kid out every hour to see what the temperature was. And after like six hours, they added up all of the temperatures and divided it by six, right? And that sound like what you did? And you were like, the average temperature today was whatever, whatever you got when you divided it by six, right? You remember doing that? Yes. Yeah, yeah, you did that. Um, and you were all excited and you felt really special and you found the average temperature and you could find averages of other things like, you know, I don't know, I don't know what else you found averages of, but you found averages of other things and you were all excited. Um, but what you didn't know was that the teacher was lying to you and that's not really what an average um, temperature for the day was. Because you see, checking the temperature once every hour is completely disregarding everything that happens in that hour, right? The temperature throughout the day is a continuous function of temperature, right? There are small fluctuations from T equals zero to T equals one and T equals one to T equals two and so on. And so what you really found was not the average temperature. It was just an average of a set of data points. And that's great. Sometimes you want an average of a set of data points, but sometimes you want to find the actual average value of a continuous function for every single point on an interval. Effectively, you want to add up the value of the function at an infinite number of points and then divide by that infinite value. And the only way we can do that is with an integral. And that's what the mean value theorem for integrals does. Okay? So, if we want to find the average value of a continuous function, we first have to define what the average value of a continuous function is. And the average value is defined as the y value or the height at which the rectangle formed by that height and the length of the interval is equal to the area underneath the curve on the interval. That makes sense to everybody or no? That's that's the definition of the average value of a function. And it's the height or the value of y that when you make that rectangle between the height and the width is equal to the area underneath the curve on that interval. Good or no? Good. Good. All right. Great. So um, the question then is, how do we find that value of h? Well, it should be pretty straightforward. What's the value of this blue area underneath this curve? How do we find the area underneath a curve? Take the integral. Exactly. We'll call this f of x, which makes this also f of x. And what we want is these two areas, like we said, to be equal. So this integral from a to b of f of x dx needs to equal this red area. And what is the value of the red area? It should just be the height. I can write letters. There we go. The height times the length of the interval, which is B minus A. B minus A. And how do we then solve for H? Because that's what we're looking for is the average value H should just be the integral divided by B minus A. Or we could, if we wanted to put that out in front as a constant, one over B minus A times the integral from A to B of F of X dx. Good or no? Good. All right. This is what we call the average value, or the mean value theorem for intervals. 
Uh, and the, the mean value theorem itself states that if the function is continuous on that interval from A to B, then there is guaranteed to be some point C on that interval where we actually hit the average value. So if we look back at the picture, there is some value within here at C where we actually hit that average value. Okay? And it's guaranteed that there will be a spot there between A and B. Good or no? Good. Great. So that's what the theorem says. And so what we want to be able to do is we want to be able to take any continuous function, find its average value, and then if needed, find the x value at which it actually hits that average value. So we're going to start with a nice, simple, easy one to make sure we remember how to integrate since it's been three months since you did any calculus. So how should we set this up? If we want to find the average value of 4 minus x squared on the interval from 0 to 3, what do we need to put out in front first? 1 over 3 minus 0. Perfect. And we need an integral from 0 to 3 of our function. So 1 over 3 minus 0 is 1 third. And what about the integral of 4? How do we integrate 4? We should get 4x. 4x. And then our integral of x squared ought to be? x cubed over 3. Good. Just using the power rule for both of those. Like some of you still remember how to math, so that's good news. Plug in your values. And remember, this is the second part of the fundamental thing of a calculus, right? Plug in the upper limit. 4 times 3 is 12. We'll right now, so 3 cubed over 3. And then minus both of those are zeros, right? Good or no? Makes sense. Good. All right. And what do we get? We get 12 minus 9, which is 3, and a third of 3, which is 1. Yeah? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Um, That's our average wait, value. Uh, why are you multiplying it, the integral, by the, the 1 minus uh, b minus a? I know that represents the average. So why That's is it exactly. multiplied by the integral? Well, that's, I mean, that's what we're, that's what the theorem says. It's 1 over b minus a times the integral gives us the average value. And that's what we're looking for, is the average value. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's why, that's the rule. That's the, that's the formula to do it. Does that make sense or no? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. And then the second part of what this is asking us is, does this actually take on this value somewhere on the interval? Well, the theorem says that it's guaranteed to. And so we want to be able to find that value. So we want to know when does 4 minus x squared equal 1? And when does 4 minus x squared equal 1? If x squared equals 3, or if x equals plus or minus root 3. And so we're looking for the one that's actually on the interval from 0 to 3. Which would be which one? Root three. Just square root three. Positive square root three. Everybody good with that? Yes. Wonderful. All right. Any questions there? So average value is one. It occurs that x equals root three. All right. Wait, so the Let's total area in that case would be three, right? Uh, yeah, the total area underneath that curve. Well, um, the value of the integral from zero to three of four minus x squared is three. The actual area underneath the curve, that's a different story because this function that requires some stuff we haven't talked about yet, but um, because this function actually crosses through the x-axis um, on this interval. In fact, I'll pull it up and show you guys. Um, that creates some issues when we talk about integrals. So give me one second here. There's Desmos. Can you guys see Desmos now? 
minus two. Yeah, so if four minus x squared um, from the integral from zero to three, what it does is anything that's above the x-axis, and we're going to talk a lot about this in about a week, but anything that's above the x-axis, so this part of it from zero to two, comes out to be a positive number from the integral, but anything that's below the x-axis actually comes out to be a negative value. So normally if we talk about the integral, it's positive and then we you know, knock off whatever this negative part is. So it's actually less than what we would see up here. Um, but if we ask for what's the area between the curve and the x-axis from zero to three, we have to take into account that this part from two to three is negative. And so we have to take the opposite of this section. We actually have to do two integrals to find the exact area to find this space between zero and two plus this space between two and three. Does that make sense? Yeah, but it's a little more complicated than just saying it's the area under the curve. It would be the area under the curve if the curve was always above the x-axis for that number, but it's not. So it's no. Um, but don't stress too much about that yet because that is something we will talk about, like I said, into this week, beginning of next week. Okay, let's do another one, unless there's other questions. Any other questions on that? All right, let's take a look at this one. We want to try to find the average value of one over X on the interval from E to two E. And then we wanna find all the values at which our function hits that average value. So I will give you guys a minute or two to set this up and see if you can work through it on your own. And then I will help you through it if you need help. Ready, go. So we should have started with one over two E minus E, and then an integral from E to two E of our function, one over DX, one over X DX. And one over two E minus E should just be one over what? E. E, and then the integral of one over X, hopefully you looked over the integral rule sheet like I told you guys to, and have those all memorized. What is that one? A line of x or natural log, I guess. Natural log of absolute value of x. Don't forget the absolute value part. Even though it's insignificant for this problem, it's not for others. And we'll evaluate that from e to 2e. And that gives us 1 over e times natural log 2e minus natural log e. And what's the natural log of 2e? Can we use like logarithm rules for this? Mm hmm So that's two times e, so that's natural log two plus natural log e minus natural log e. Natural log of e minus natural log of e cancels out. And note also that you should know natural log of e is just one, right? But those still cancel. So you just end up with natural log of two over e. And that is our average value of our function from e to two e. Good or no? Great. It does say find the values at which it obtains this value though. So let's set our original function equal to that. And all you gotta do is then take a reciprocal to get that that happens when X is E over L and T. Everybody good there or no? So let's go back to our elementary school problem um, where we had a bunch of temperatures and we added them all together and we found an average. So back in third grade, you just added these all up and you divided by 13 because there were 13 data points. But now we're going to at least be able to approximate the area underneath a curve that has these data points. So now ours isn't going to be an exact value for the continuous function because we don't know the actual function represented, but we can approximate it by using 
one of our rules for approximation. We're going to use the trapezoidal rule, but make sure that you go back through your notes and review the trapezoidal rule and your left, right, and midpoint rectangular approximations because you're going to need all of those when we start going through our review for the AP test. And so we're going to approximate the integral using a trapezoidal rule. So we should be doing one over, we say we started at noon and zero and then that would be 12. And we'll call it the temperature function T of X, dx. And like we said, we're going to approximate Approximate this, but we're going to approximate this using, I don't know why I made that error so short, using the trapezoidal rule. So we have the 112. And what's the beginning of the trapezoidal rule say? Delta x over 2. Say that again? Delta x over 2. <laughs> Mm, not delta x over 2, but the change in the x's, so 12 minus 0 over n, which is the number of subintervals, and then divide that by 2. And then what goes inside of here? The first y value, which is 63, plus what? Two of the second y value. Plus two of the next, all the way up to the We get to two of the second to last, and one of the last. And if we go all the way through there, this becomes 1 24th of whatever this is. And you guys will go through and evaluate that for me and tell me what you get. Anybody got a value for that? Fifty nine and a half degrees. Hmm. That seems a little low. Just based on what all these numbers are. I think you might have missed a number somewhere. Sixty five point two degrees. We're gonna always round to three decimals or more. So sixty five, that sounds better. Sixty five point what? One six seven. Uh, okay, that sounds better. Other people get that same value. Just to make sure. Yes. All right. So if you didn't get that, you probably just typed something into the calculator wrong. So just be careful with that. Everybody good there or no? Any questions on this idea of the mean value theorem? All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to take a, um, I'm going to take a couple of different integrals. I'm just going to give you guys a few to practice with, and we'll do the mean value theorem with them. Um, but mostly this is just going to be for you guys to practice using um, you know all the rules for integrals. So let's find the average value of 
f of x equals 1 over 1 plus x squared plus 2x on the interval from negative 1 to 1. So I'll give you guys two, three minutes to try to work through that, and then we'll go through it together. If you don't remember how to do some of the integrals, take a look on the integral rule sheet that's in Google Drive, and I posted the link to it in Google Classroom yesterday. Ready, go. All right, so we should have started with one over what? One minus negative one. Ah, yeah, good. Okay, one minus negative one, integral negative one to one of one over one plus x squared plus two x dx. So what does that put out in front of our integral? That's just a one half, right? And what's the integral of one over one plus x squared? Inverse tangent. Inverse tangent, yeah. Good. And the integral of 2x is x squared, right? So we'll evaluate that from negative 1 to 1. So we've got 1 half. And then we've got inverse tangent of 1 plus 1 squared. And then minus inverse tangent of negative 1 plus one. Everybody good with that so far? Hopefully, what's the inverse tangent of one? Pi over four or five, five pi over four? No, just pi over four. It is whenever you take the inverse tangent of something, you always get out a value between negative pi over two and pi over two. Always, 100% of the time. All right. Same thing with inverse sine. If you in, take the inverse sine of something, you always get out a value between negative pi over two and pi over two. If you take the inverse cosine of something, you always get out a value between zero and pi. That's something you guys should know from class last school year, not my class, but whatever math you were in last year. The so inverse tangent of one is pi over four, not pi over four or five pi over four. And then plus one, and then we're gonna have a minus one, so those will cancel, right? And then minus the inverse tangent of negative one, and what's the inverse tangent of negative one? Negative pi fours. Negative pi over four, good. And so pi over four plus pi over four is two pi over four or pi over two, but we're gonna divide that by two, which is just gonna give us pi over four. So the average value of one over one plus x squared plus two x from negative one to one is pi over four. Exactly pi over four. If you add up the infinite number of points from negative one to one and divide by that infinite number of points, the average is pi over four. Good or no? Is that good or not good? Good. Oh, good. We're going to find the average value of the cosine of 4x. And let's do this on the interval from 0 to pi over six. So I'll give you guys a minute or two to work on it on your own and then we'll go through it together. Ready, go. So we should have one over pi over six minus zero. 
times the integral from zero to five over six of cosine four x dx, right? That's our setup, that should be easy. And then we've got to integrate cosine four x. So what do we have to do to integrate cosine four x? U substitution. It's gotta be a U substitution. So we'll substitute out the four x, which tells us that d is four dx, which means we're gonna put in a one fourth here and a four here. And that's going to allow us to do what? It's gonna allow us to turn the four dx into a du and the cosine four x into a cosine u. And so let's kind of simplify this out in front if we can. We got one over pi over six, which is six over pi. So we got six over four pi, which would be three over two pi. And we're gonna have cosine u du. And what's going to happen to our limits? Anytime you do a u substitution, you also have to change your limits, right? Four times zero is still zero, but four times pi over six is now two pi over three. Everybody remember how to do these basic u substitutions? Hopefully, okay. So now we've got three over two pi. What's the integral of cosine u? Sine u. Sine u, and we'll evaluate that from zero to two pi over three. So we've now got three over two pi, and what's the sine of two pi over three? Yeah, that's right, it's root three over two. And the sine of zero is zero. And so our final result is three root three over four pi. Good or not? Questions or issues with that? Um, I did it a little differently, but I got the same answer. Okay, how did you do it differently? Um, I just knew that if it was 4x in there, well, I just know that, I don't know, I maybe did the- You did the u substitution in your head and got I one guess. and just, and then converted it back. Yeah, you, I mean, you just said the integral of cosine 4x is one fourth sine 4x. Four yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Um, that's you fine. don't have to end up changing these limits. And yeah, I would hope that by the end of this class, anybody that's going on to another calculus class, at least for sure, whether it's mine or in college, will do the simple u substitutions like this just in your head and just get you know one fourth sine four x. Okay, thank you. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I would. It would be great if you could all do those in your head. All right, let's do uh, let's do one more. And then we'll call it good for today. Have an easy day back. So we're going to find the average value of how about f of x equals, oh, what's a good one here to do? Let's do. Hmm. How about x over the square root of one minus x squared. And let's do this on the interval from about, mm, a negative a half to a half. All right, ready? Work through it on your own if you can, and then we'll talk about it in a bit. Ready, go. So first off, it should be one over one half minus negative one half, and then an integral from negative a half to a half of x over root one minus x squared dx. 
And we might be tempted to think this looks sort of like an inverse sine integral, but that x in the numerator throws things off. And so what do we have to do to integrate this? Just make it x times one over a square root one minus x squared. We can't we can't do that with uh, I mean we could we could rewrite it as x times that but it's still because that would be a product of two functions we can't have a we can't take the integral of each one separately so we got to do something else here in fact this one's not going to involve inverse sine at all even though it really looks like it's going to. It's going to have to be another u substitution. And what do we want to substitute out? The uh, 1 minus x squared. Yeah, we let u equal 1 minus x squared. du will be negative 2x dx. And we'll be able to get rid of that 1 minus x squared and get rid of that x. To get rid of the x, we'll need to put a negative 2 in here, which means we're going to have to put what out front? A negative 1 half, right? And so let's simplify the outside part first. Negative a half is negative a half. And then this one over a half minus negative a half is one over one. So really, we've just got a negative one half out in front. And we're going to have an integral of, let's see, this is negative 2x dx. That'll just be du. And this will be a root u in the denominator, or u to the negative one half du. And then we'll have to put in our limits of integration here. Uh, this one becomes a nice fun little one here. What's negative one half when I plug it in here? Got to plug in right, one minus negative one half squared. What is that? Three fourths. Three fourths. And what about the other one? I do one minus one half squared also three-fourths, right? So what does this come out to be without actually having to integrate? Zero. It comes out to just be zero, right? Because we know we have them, remember our integral rules, the integral from A to A, if those upper and lower limits are the same, doesn't matter what's in here, the value is zero. So the average value of that function from negative a half to a half is just zero. Um, and if we wanted to, you know, I'll, I'll do it up here. If we wanted to just integrate u to the negative one half du, what does that come out to be? We go up to u to the one half, right? And divide by a half, so multiply by two. Two root u. Yeah, if we had if we had limits on it, be with limits on it, we could we could say this is just plus a c. But just to, so that's what the integral would come out to be. It'd be two root u. And we'd have, what do we have in front of it? We have a negative one half. But since we're still evaluating it from three fourths to three fourths, it's still just going to be zero. Right? We don't really need these plus c's since we have a definite integral. I guess we could do it this way. Does that make sense to everybody? Everybody feel okay about that? Yes. Cool. All right. I think that's a good place to stop for our first day back.